Good morning, folk. Welcome. It's good to have you with us this morning as we come into the Lord's house on His day. And again, seek to lift up our hearts and voices in the praise and adoration of our great triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we've... As we continue um, in our worship, uh, let us uh, pray together. As we have read and sang already this morning, we reflect on the name Daniel called you, Ancient of Days. We acknowledge, Father God, that you were there from the beginning. You've been around all through all known history, and that you will be there for eternity. O oh Lord, you are permanent and everlasting. We worship you this morning as our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who all work together in our lives, enabling us to bring glory to you. We thank you too for the privilege that we have to meet together as the Ecclesia of God, gathering to worship our faithful God, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and whose mercy, love, and provisions for us is always there and never ceases. We thank you for the blood of Christ, which was shed for our sins, and the promised forgiveness in 1 John 1 verse 9, that we've, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We humbly stand before you and ask for your forgiveness for where we've gone on our own way, where we've trusted in our own abilities, where we have believed that we can do things better in our own strength. Forgive us, Lord, for our pride, and through your Holy Spirit, help us not to make the same mistakes over and over again, but let us rather hear your voice and obey it. As a God who knows, listens, and understands us, we humbly bring our prayers and petitions to your throne of grace. We pray for our president, the government, and the NCCC, especially with the rollout of the COVID vaccine, that this would be done with your wisdom, that people would continue to be careful and considerate until such time as the herd immunity has reached in our population. We pray for the protection of the frontline workers administering those vaccines, that they might always know your presence and peace with them. Give them the opportunity to share your gospel with the people they are treating as part of their mission. We pray for further relaxation in the number of people that are able to gather together in religious worship services, and that the basis of this would be changed to a percentage of the size of the facility and not just a discrete number as it is now. And Father, as uh, Gavin mentioned earlier, we thank you too for the good attendance at the men's breakfast yesterday when Sibusisu addressed our men regarding managing transitions, describing the various types of transitions that we might need to manage, and shared a model of Joshua in our approach to managing those transitions, always inquiring of God for his wisdom and leading. We pray that both the visitors and regulars have been encouraged to seek the Lord in all that they do. We reflect on the prayer of Paul in Philippians 1, where Paul prayed, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. With the number of funerals and memorial services that, we've, um, that have been occurring recently, where many unsaved and needy people have had the opportunity to hear the gospel and to reflect on their purpose in life, I pray that those seeds of salvation that have been planted in their hearts 
might be watered and grow until those people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, who alone can save. We pray especially for those who have hardened their hearts and are opposed to Christianity, that you would put them in situations where their hearts will be softened and that you will be gracious in causing them to be born again. We pray too for the finances of Rambo Baptist Church, knowing that we started the year with a shortfall in our income, and we pray that you would encourage those who are blessed to continue, and wisdom for the finance committee to reduce expenditure in the correct areas. We continue to thank you over and we continue to thank you for the over and above giving to the We Care Fund and the many people that have been blessed via that fund. We too lift up a Kulukani and our church plant in Dipslut that are still unable to meet together due to a lack of a suitable venue to meet in. And we pray that you would undertake to provide a suitable venue for our people there to meet together as the Ecclesia of God there in prayer and adoration of you. Give Kulukani the wisdom he needs to evaluate and consider some of the options that have just opened up and are available to him now. And now as we continue to worship and acknowledge in your grace towards us in song, prepare our hearts to receive your word from Matthew 7, dealing with the choices we face in our everyday lives as Pastor Gavin delivers his message placed on his heart. We pray that your Holy Spirit would move within the hearts of everyone who listens, that the Holy Spirit would encourage us to inquire of God in our choices and to spend time in his word confirming his plans for us and encouraging us with numerous examples of his faithfulness and love as we seek his will. May we be a God-fearing people seeking to worship, serve, and honor you in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Look, if you've got your Bibles with you, won't you turn with me to Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7, as we continue journeying through the Sermon on the Mount. We come to some hard-hitting passages in the texts that follow. As I said to you last Sunday, I think verse 12 wraps up the main body of the sermon. And what the Lord Jesus Christ does after that is He gives a series of contrasts. And through those series of contrasts really does give us a big red light that is flashing uh, where we are to wake up and uh, almost hear the sirens, the emergency lights in terms of what is happening with our spiritual condition and to take everything that we've considered as we've journeyed through the Sermon on the Mount and to hear the warnings, to hear the gravity of uh, what the Lord is actually saying in terms of wake up and look at yourselves. Where are you in terms of your spiritual walk and your spiritual condition? So our text this morning will be just the, uh, verses 13 and 14 as we come to the first of that set of warnings uh, given directly from the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Folk, with that in mind, let's bow together and pray and ask for the, Lord, for the help uh, of his spirit as we come to worship him, even through the hearing of his words this morning. Lord, we are thankful for the reminder even in the, in the words that we've just sung that it's not through us but Christ in me, that all we have is in him that our sufficiency is in Him. We come with nothing of ourselves. It is indeed by grace that we're saved through faith, not by works, lest any of us should boast. We cannot please you in any way except to throw ourselves fully and finally on the Lord Jesus Christ and to be clothed in His royal robes, to be counted as righteous because of Him. And the Father, we're thankful for those rich truths. And Father, we do pray now that as we turn our attention to your word, cause your spirit to speak, Lord, we do pr pray that the hearts of believers would be encouraged and strengthened and uh, even joyful as we leave here this morning, as we consider God's grace in terms of where we are. Father, we do pray for any gathered here or sitting outside or in the hall or even watching later uh, to the video 
at their own leisure. Lord, we do pray that your spirit would be at work in the lives of any that don't know you, that uh, maybe think they do. And uh, Father, we do pray for rightful soul examination to happen. Uh, Father, cause this text to be applied to our lives powerfully through the ministry of your spirit, we pray. And so Father, we do pray that as we come, cause our eyes to be opened, our ears to be unblocked, our hearts to be warmed. And come and do your work in us, we pray. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. A number of years ago, I had the privilege together with uh, Carmen and Natanya of visiting Mpumalanga. We went up to a little trout farm uh, outside of Dulstrom, and uh, we left on a Sunday afternoon and cruised up there quite nicely until we got to the access road to this particular farm uh, that we needed to go down. Uh, I was driving my Corolla. I thought every nut and bolt was going to fly off the thing. The rivets were popping. Uh, I was pretty convinced that Natanya was going to end up with shaken baby syndrome just by driving down this road. It is a road that was not designed for sedans. It was a road that was designed for four by fours on steroids. But we got there and we breathed and we enjoyed a few days there. And when it came time to leave, I thought there's no ways I can do that again. There's just, uh, I'm not going to have a car left by the time we get to the tar road. Let me take the map and see if there's a different way. And lo and behold, there was. There it was. As he came out the gate, instead of turning right, turn left. It's shorter. Dulstrom is just around the corner. And if I can get to the town, I'm styling. We're fine. So I turned left. It was fine for about 150 meters. I stretched it to 200. I stretched it to about a kilometer and a half. We were down to bedrock, loose gravel. Uh, I was worried about my sump. You're impressed. I actually do know there's a sump on a motor car. I think it's underneath there somewhere. I thought it was going to be ripped out and so forth. It was just going nowhere quickly. And I thought life and limb and vehicle and uh, family's health are all at stake here. Let's turn around and at least go back the, the original way, which was not great anyway. At least that was designed for a 4x4, four four, not a Sherman tank. And uh, we managed to get back onto the tar and we lived to tell the proverbial tale. But the point that I'm making is that which looked good, that which looked reasonable, that which looked shorter turned out not to be. It was a bad move heading for absolute disaster. And I think we can identify with that in, in many of the choices that we face even in terms of life. That which we look at that seems good, seems reasonable, seems like the best idea, actually turns out in the end to be really, really bad. It might be a vehicle purchase and you've got two great cars on offer and you opt to take the nicer one and the, the one with the better finance plan and so forth. Uh, but soon after that, the car begins to shake, rattle, and roll. It surfaces that it was in a major accident. It turns out that the odometer was turned back a few hundred thousand kilometers, and you've been had. It seemed good, but it was an absolute con. Maybe a purchase of a house, and you've got house A and house B on offer. And you go for the nicer one. It's in a better neighborhood. It's close to good schools. The traffic isn't so bad in the morning and so forth. But after a couple of months or years, the cracks start to surface. Uh, you see where they've plastered over the issues. The leaks start to appear that were carefully disguised. And you realize you've been had. It wasn't as good as it seemed to be. Maybe it was investments. There are two products on offer. And the one is going to give you the greatest return and the, the least risk. Uh, but soon after that, that particular aspect of the market crashes and burns and you find that you've lost everything. Maybe it's a business purchase. You've got two businesses on offer and you're off, off to the one that's the most stable seemingly and the one that's going to make you the most money and uh, cause you to work the least amount of time and so forth. Uh, but the lack of due diligence comes back and bites you as that entire business crashes and burns. And uh, the liabilities and the creditors come uh, sneaking through the back door. And we know what it's like. It seemed good. I was really excited about that prospect. It was well packaged. It was the opportunity of a lifetime. But it turns out that having gone down that particular path, there is just loss, there is pain, there is disappointment, there is distress, there is hardship. That would seem to be good. That would seem to be sound and wholesome turned out to be an absolute disaster. And folk, we want to get that into our minds this morning, not just in a life, general life sense, but spiritually. Because God gives us, in His Word, choices, but choices with consequences. We can see that all the way through. Even from the early pages of Genesis, there are choices that are put before Adam and Eve. We come to the book of Deuteronomy as the people of Israel are about to enter into the promised land, into the land of Canaan, and there are choices that are put before them. 
uh, I put before you these choices, life and death, that is repeated even in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 21, where the Lord says, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. Listen, my people, which way are you going to go? You can follow me and be led to life. Or you can follow your idolatry and your wickedness and your sinfulness and all the pagan nations around and just know that it's not going to end well for you. It's the path of death. When we come to the issues of the gospel, there are choices that are put before us as well. Heaven and hell are realities. The Bible does not mince words regarding that. The Bible certainly does not deceive us in terms of those eternal realities heaven and eternal life in a perfect glorified body in the very presence of our God and Savior forever in a new heaven and a new earth in a place where there are no more tears and pain and sickness and death forever is a choice. You can, you can go there. You can enjoy those eternal benefits and revel with glory and joy in the presence of God forever. It's contrasted against the reality of hell, a place of conscious eternal torment enduring the perpetual wrath of God for all eternity to come for one's sin and one's unbelief for the rejection of his grace where the blistering hot anger of God is burning against people forever in that place of wailing and gnashing of teeth the Bible's clear there are choices set before us there are routes that we can follow one leads to life and the other one leads to death And the issue that we have on this side of death, this side of uh, passing into that state, we have the decision to make in terms of which path we're going to follow. Are we going to follow the path of life or death, the path of heaven or hell, the path of infinite and unending joy, or the path that leads to infinite and unending judgment? God lays those choices before us as to our eternal destination. And the choice that we have while on earth is to which path we're going to follow. It would be easy if we looked at the issues in front of us and we could clearly see the destination, we could clearly see the outcomes, we could clearly see what's going to happen through the, uh, the path and what happens at the end of the road. If the outcome was put in front of us, it would, would be crystal clear. It would be a no-brainer in terms of what we're going to see. If it's life and heaven and joy uh, versus uh, death, sorrow and hell, no, none of us would be cho- choosing uh, unwisely at all. But focus, we're going to see this morning. It's crystal clear, that uh, cr- crucial that we see this up front. The branding on the gates as we come to those choices in life are confusing. The branding is a paradox. Satan as the master deceiver has created confusion as we approach those entry gates or those entrance gates that we need to choose. You see, the one gate is hard to get through. The one gate, as we're going to see, is strict access control. Stuff is demanded of you. You can't come through that gate with all your lifestyle issues and your sin issues and your habit issues. It doesn't fit through the narrow, constricting turnstiles that uh, feature at that particular entry, entry gate. And as you walk up to that gate and you peer through and you look at the road ahead, it seems to be a hard road. It's a twisty road. It's a, it's a rocky road. There seem to be difficulties there. There, there are challenges there. The people on that road seem to be suffering. There seems to be persecution. There's there's opposition. They're they're going through hardship. As you look carefully, there are not a lot of people on that road either. It seems hard to get in through the turnstiles, but once you're in, it's a hard road to walk, and you you can't really see where it's going in the the future. But right next to that, that is another gate. It's a bright gate. It's a warm, warm, inviting gate. It's welcoming. There's easy access. There's no demands. There's no stress. You can walk through freely onto a nicely paved in one size highway with frequent water points and lots of people, lots of company with whom you can enjoy uh, fellowship and conversation with along the way. Those gates are put in front of us in terms of which way we're going to choose. But folks, the crucial thing that we need to see in this text this morning as we come to it in a moment or two is that both gates are labeled heaven. Both gates are labeled heaven. That is Satan's deception at play. Both gates promise life. Both gates promise eternal pleasure. Both gates promise reward and joy. Both gates are saying, won't you come in this way and find the way to salvation and God and eternal reward? Get that clear in your mind. There is deception at the entry gates. 
God in his mercy knows that, and so he warns people. You see, we can't see that. We don't know that the deception is there. And so when we come to this text, in the words of Jesus Christ, the God-man who fully knows those dangers that we're facing, Jesus warns us as to those gates. He warns us as to those paths. He warns us as to the people that are on those paths. He warns us as to the eternal destination of where those paths are heading. He knows that we've got a problem because we're just looking at the two gates and both of them are labeled life. Both of them are labeled salvation. And so easily we could be confused and we could be deceived when we make our choices as to which gate to go through and which path to follow. But God in his goodness knows the end game. He knows the destination. And so he warns us and so he instructs us as to which gate and which path to take. You've got your Bibles open. Have a look with me. Matthew chapter 7, and let's pick up at verse 13. This is the word of God. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter it are many, for the gate is narrow, And the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Just so far reads God's word this morning. But what we're going to do this morning is we're going to consider those two gates, the two routes, the two crowds, or lack of crowds on the one, and the two destinations. We're going to consider those choices that lie before us. But as we do so, again, I would encourage you just to see that both of them are labeled heaven. Both of them are labeled life. And that, I think, will help us to make sense of the commandment that the Lord Jesus Christ gives us in these verses. So as we approach these verses this morning, I actually want to do it in reverse. I not just know about some sin cars, I know about reverse gear as well. So let's come to these verses in reverse. I want to track backwards through the text. I think it's going to help us the most to make sense of that this morning. And to consider, firstly, gate number one. Gate number one, which is the route that leads to destruction. Gate number one, the route that leads to destruction, and we can see that there in verse 13. For the gate is wide, and the way is easy, says Jesus, that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. But what we need to do this morning is just define what this wide gate actually is. What is actually on offer? What is the choice? And it's basically, as Jesus is teaching here, this is presented as a means of entering into the kingdom of God. You will recall as we've tracked through the Sermon on the Mount that the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven are terms that refer to salvation. A sinner is rescued, he is redeemed from the kingdom of darkness, from the kingdom of Satan, where Satan has authority, and a sinner is transferred into the kingdom of God's beloved Son, that is salvation language, A sinner then submits to Jesus Christ as Lord and Master and King, loves Him as King, serves Him as King, obeys Him as King, follows Him as King. That's what it means to be in the kingdom. We're rescued from the kingdom of darkness and we're brought into another kingdom where we need to then live as a citizen of that kingdom. This gate that is described here in verse 13 seems to be a legitimate entrance into that kingdom. The signage above that gate says, come, come and buy your ticket into the kingdom of heaven. There are no turnstiles, there are no body checks, there are no health checks, there's no thermometer, there's nothing to sign, there's nothing to commit to. Can I say to you, it's easier to get into that gate than it is to get into our nine o'clock worship service on a Sunday morning at the moment. You can just walk in freely. Nobody's asking you anything. Nobody's checking anything. Nobody's saying that you can't come in. It's almost unhindered access. Come as you are. No issues, no problems. It's a very inviting gate. It's an open invitation, it seems, for salvation. And we might be deceived to think that that is consistent with the gospel. You go, for example, back to Isaiah chapter 55 with that wonderful Old Testament invitation, come. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come and buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Come, says God, come to salvation in me. Similar words echoed by the Lord Jesus Christ just a few chapters later in Matthew's gospel. 
Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and in me you will find rest for yourselves. But, but come, it seems to be an open gate. And that's how Satan deceives, because that gate is wide. You walk through as if Jesus has just invited you to come with all of your issues as you are and find salvation in him. And the label above that gate says heaven, life, joy, peace, forever. And people want to get in through that gate. That's what they're looking for. They're looking for that state of eternal satisfaction and joy. And so people are rushing through that gate. As we go back to there to verse 13, we can see that that wide gate leads to an easy way as well. There's no hardship. There's no sacrifice. There's no challenge. And the point that the Lord Jesus Christ is making even through this word picture is that wide gate leads to an easy path where there is no repentance that is necessary. You just walk in. You walk in with your sin. You walk in with your issues. You walk in with your lifestyle. You come as you are, which is part of the gospel. That's true. But the point is there's no change. There's no change that is called for. There's no call to transform and to repent and to deal with those issues. Come as you are and find forgiveness in God, but there's no call to submit to him as Lord of your life. There's no call to put yourself under the king's authority as you're walking down that broad path. Do you remember the flow of the Sermon on the Mount, as I've just said, it's all about the kingdom. It means that there is a king, and that king demands that his citizens in his kingdom live in a way that is consistent with his standards. But the easy path that we have here in verse 13 doesn't teach that. Come, it's an open invitation, broad gate, easy way. Come and find Jesus as your savior. Come and find Jesus as your friend. Come and find Jesus as your psychotherapist. Come and find Jesus as your buddy. Come and find Jesus as a good man. Come and find Jesus as a prophet. Come and find Jesus in whatever way you want to find him, but there's no call to submit to him as Lord and master of your life. Do you see Satan's deception? Come through this gate. It's a broad gate. It's an easy way. Lots of people are walking down this road. It's going to lead you to life and God and heaven and eternal joy. But there's no call to submit to Christ. But this is such a practical thing to consider in the flow of where Jesus has been since chapter 5. As we consider the broad gate and the easy way this morning, as we track it through all the way from the early verses in chapter 5, going through that gate... And walking on that broad way does not mean that you need to be poor in spirit. It does not mean that you need to mourn over your sin. You don't need to see your desperate spiritual need. There's no call to be broken before God. To walk through the broad gate and go down the easy way does not call you to be meek. It means that you don't have to hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's a non-issue which you can come with all of your unrighteousness and walk down that road. Come through the broad gate and onto the easy way. You don't have to be merciful. You don't have to be pure in heart. You don't have to be a peacemaker. You're not going to suffer persecution on the easy way because, hey, nobody knows you're a Christian. You're blending in with anybody else on that, or everyone else on that broad way as well. As you come through that broad gate and down the easy way, you don't have to be salt and light. You just blend into the world around you. There's no call on the easy way to have exceeding righteousness as we see there in chapter 5 verse 20. Christ's righteousness applied to you and then, then to live that out in practical ways. As you will go and come through the broad gate and the easy way, there's no call to confess and deal with your sinful anger. There's no reason to deal with your lust and your immoral lifestyle. If you come through the broad gate and walk on the easy way, you can float in and out of marriage as you want to with no thought to God's high view of marriage and the divorce that is detestable to him as Jesus teaches in Matthew 5. Come through that gate and walk that path. You don't have to be, be truthful. You let your yes be yes and your no be no is not an issue on that path. You can say one thing and blatantly know it's untrue. You don't have to avoid retaliation on that way. It's part and parcel of who you are. 
You don't have to avoid partiality and try and be nice to people and love as God loves and be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Anything goes on that easy way. Materialism on that path can consume your life and money and career and advancement and corporate success and having newer and bigger things dominates you and dominates your life and dominates your thinking and dominates your priorities. Being hypercritical and judgmental is okay on that way because that's what the world does. Come through that gate, you're going to get to God and heaven eventually, but you don't have to lose anything along the way. The lie that Satan is peddling is come. Jesus loves you as you are, but you don't need to change anything. He's going to keep loving you as you are. Come through this wide gate onto this easy path and call yourself a Christian and wear the label and go to church sometimes that, hey, life just carries on as it did before. There's no sacrifice. There's no obedience. There's no submission to the king. Folk, what we need to see this morning is that countless people have come through that gate and are on that easy path. Maybe people you know are on that path. And is it possible even as we sit here this morning, or for those watching later on video, is it you possibly that have come through that gate and are on that path? I need to be clear on that this morning because I think this text is often mistaught and misrepresented. What Jesus is doing here is not giving us a general picture of heaven and hell and eternal salvation and eternal damnation for all people. He's painting a very particular issue and nailing a very particular issue on the head. The broad path leading to destruction is not to do with the millions of people who want nothing to do with Christianity, who have rejected God and who are going down a a road of their own making with no sense of Christianity and Christ and the Bible at all. That's not the issue that Jesus is dealing with here. What Jesus is dealing with here in these verses, done done the the broad way and the, uh, the broad gate and the easy way, is the path of easy believism. The people on that broad path that have come, well, on that easy path that have come through that broad gate, think that they are Christian. Think that they are right with God. Think that they're in a right condition with their maker. That's the point that Jesus is making. He's not not talking about people that are rabidly anti-God in any way. He's talking about those who are deceived. That's why the lie is so great. This is the gate and the path that is teaching truths about Christ and the cross, where you can just come and accept some fiery insurance from hell that Jesus provides, and you'll be fine. You're on your way to heaven. This is the path where you're fooled into thinking that you're okay. Well, you're a believer, well, you're a Christian, but you're actually not. And that's the danger. Because we consider these verses this morning, as Jesus speaks, I think it's clear to see that many, many, many people have been fed that lie and live that lie every single day. People you know live this lie. I can be an angry Christian. I can be a Christian and a serial adulterer. I can be a Christian teenager or a Christian student or a Christian young adult, and I can engage in an open, repetitive pattern of sexual immorality over and over again, but hey, I'm going to heaven. I can be a young adult or a student and move in with my boyfriend or girlfriend and live together and enjoy a life of sexual immorality. Hey, we're Christians. What's the South African deal? I can fat and sit as a believer. I can be a Christian, walking that path, thinking I'm going to heaven, holding to whatever sexual orientation I want to and labeling myself with whatever letter of the alphabet suits me on a particular day, but hey, I'm a God follower and I'm going to heaven. I can be a Christian and I can lie and I can cheat and I can deceive people. I can be a Christian and love the world more than God. I can be more consumed with money and advancement and stuff. I can be a Christian and not pray. I can be a Christian and not love God. I can be a Christian and not love people. But hey, I'm okay because I'm on the path. I've gone through the gate labeled heaven. Do you see the deception? Do you see how Satan plays with our minds? Do you see the gravity of this warning? Do you see why Jesus needs to come and confront this issue? 
These are not anti-God haters. These are people who think they're okay. And they're on the path leading to destruction. What does Jesus say to that kind of thinking? What does he say to the great multitude of people on that path thinking they're okay, thinking they're safe, thinking they're uh, Christian, thinking they're heading for heaven? Jesus says, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those that walk or enter by it are many. Because we consider these hard words this morning, let's heed the hard words. That path leads to destruction. That path leads to judgment. That that path leads to hell forever. Oh, folk, it may be labeled as heaven. It may have a pretty sign up at the gate, but the end point is destruction and hell. And Jesus, in his goodness, is crystal clear. Many have been deceived. Many are walking that path thinking they're okay, but in reality, they're not. Many have chosen that path thinking it's a good path, thinking they're Christian, thinking they're safe, they're quite, but they're quite comfortable with their sin and with their lifestyles and their, their morality and what they do, working up favor with God. And in his goodness, Jesus throws up this red light warning. You need to hear the sirens ringing out from this text this morning. You are in danger. You are in danger on that path. Don't go through that gate. Don't walk down that easy path. And my friends, sitting here this morning or listening to the video later on, if you have, if you have gone through that, and if you're feeling even now the stirring of the Spirit of God within you, that you are in danger, that you've gone through the wrong gate, that you're on the wrong path, get off. Get off. There's still time. If you think that you're saved, if you think that you're a Christian, if you think that you're heading for heaven, but there's no submission to the king, there's no grieving of your sin, there's no repentance, and there's just an open pattern of sinfulness that you love and that you celebrate and that you flaunt publicly, worry. You're on a path heading for a dangerous, dangerous place eternally. That's gate number one, the route that leads to destruction. But folk, against that backdrop, the Lord Jesus Christ, as we continue to just backtrack through these verses, shows us the second gate. Gate number two is the uh, route to life, which we see there in verse 14. Have a look with me with it in your Bibles. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. But this gate is also labeled heaven. The sign above this gate also offers life and joy and eternal rest in God's presence. It offers exactly the same as the other gate. It's the same branding. But this gate looks very, very different. It's a narrow gate. It's small. It's constricting. It's hard to get through. Like the Greek almost does imply a sense of turnstile where you've got to squeeze through. You can't get in with your kit and your bags and your backpack and your shopping. This gate is different in that way. And as you look through that gate and gaze down the path that lies ahead, as I said earlier, it, it's rocky. It's difficult. And folk, Jesus is again talking about salvation here. He's again talking about entering into the kingdom of God and how sinners come into a saved relationship with him. Yes, there's the open invitation, come. Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. That's true. But how do you get through that narrow gate into the path that leads to life? Okay, if you've got your Bibles open, just flick back a page or two with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20. And I think that answers the question for us. Back in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, Jesus says this, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. That's what we're asking. How do we get in? How do we get into the kingdom of heaven? How do sinners get in? And the point that Jesus made there right back in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20 is this. Your own human righteousness doesn't cut it. Human effort doesn't cut it. 
religious diligence doesn't cut it. Doing Bible stuff doesn't meet the grade. Trying to be a good person isn't enough to please God. Jesus looks at the scribes and the Pharisees, the very best examples of human morality that people at the time could look at, and he says, they're not getting in. They're trying really, really hard. They're the most diligent, fastidious Jews there are, and their righteousness isn't enough. You need an exceeding righteousness, not to work up that, but to cling to the one who offers us exceeding righteousness, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we saw as we even tracked through those verses last year. We don't come to this gate with all of our stuff and all of our pride and all of our achievements and all of our religion and all of our morality the narrow gate is narrow because we enter through Christ alone it strips away our human pride it strips away our effort it strips away our accomplishments it reminds us doesn't it of the beatitudes we come through that narrow gate being poor in spirit we come through that narrow gate mourning over our sin we come through that narrow gate, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, Christ applied to us, and then the desire to live that out. We come through Christ alone, not through anything that we bring. To the children who are present or listening after the fact, you might remember the series of videos that we did about midway through last year, uh, put together by Corlia and Carmen. And one of them, as we track through the I am statements of the Lord Jesus Christ, was Jesus says, I am the door, there in Matthew chapter 10. And I'll just read those verses for you again. The kids might remember it, even if the parents don't. John chapter 10, at least, from verse 7. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief only comes to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have that abundantly. The point that Jesus is making is to get into salvation, to get into eternal life, to get into a relationship with God can, is only achieved through one way, and that is through him he is the door he is the entry point where we're resting on his righteousness alone the person who enters through the narrow gate sees their need clings to Christ's perfect righteousness alone you can't bypass that gate there's only one way to be saved there's only one way to come to God there's only one name under heaven by which men may, may be saved Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The only way to God, the only way to heaven, the only way to eternal life is through that narrow gate, and that narrow gate is the door, which is Jesus Christ himself. But the point is, you can't come and squeeze in with your sin. Come all who are weary and heavy laden. Come with your sin, but it needs to be repented of, it needs to be lost, it needs to be dealt with as you come to the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't come and squeeze through that gate with all of your works and all of your goodness and all of your morality. Those need to be seen in the words of Isaiah as those filthy rags that are detestable before God and you strip off and go through that gate in a sense naked. I come with nothing. Isn't that why Augustus', Augustus top lady penned those phenomenal words in that hymn, Rock of Ages? It is Rock of Ages. It, is, it might be a different hymn. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. I don't come with anything else. I need to strip away absolutely everything that I'm holding on to to get through that narrow gate the sad reality is that not many do not many do because it's hard to give up that which we love and that which we want to hold on to we can see that later on in Matthew's gospel and have a look at uh, Jesus encounter with the rich young ruler and what happens directly after that as he engages in conversation with his disciples Matthew 19 23 and Jesus said to his disciples, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich man enter the kingdom of heaven. 
Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to or a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, well, who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and he said, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. The point that Jesus is making is that it's hard to give up self. It's hard to give up that which we love. It's hard to give up our sin. It's hard to give up our priorities. It's hard to give up that which is important and to come naked in the words of top lady to Christ to give us dress and to come through Christ alone. But you enter through the narrow gate to find salvation. That's the only way. And when you do, then what? What happens when you come with poverty of spirit? What happens when you come mourning over your sin? What happens when you come hungering and thirsting for a righteousness that you can't work up yourself and looking to Christ to provide that for you? What do you do when you come longing for that exceeding righteousness beyond the scribes and the Pharisees that bring you into the kingdom of God? God saves, God rescues, God redeems. For our sake, God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. When we come to that narrow gate, when we come to the door, when we come realizing there's nothing I can bring, then by faith God clothes us with the righteousness of Christ and we can enter in through him alone into that path that leads to genuinely to life and to heaven and to eternal hope and to joy forever. It's through Him and through Him alone do we come into a relationship with our Creator. But folk, at that stage, there's still a road to be walked. We've got through the narrow gate, that's true. We're through the turnstiles by faith in Christ alone. But there's still a road to be walked. Somebody who comes through that gate of Christ then has the Christian journey to walk. And as you look ahead down that path, in the words of Jesus, we need to see that it's not an easy path. It's a hard path. This is not the end one heading for destruction. And what Jesus is saying to us is this. There is a cost that comes with discipleship. Being a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, having come through that narrow gate, is going to cost you. Do you remember a couple of years ago as I was preaching through Mark's gospel? I came to Mark chapter 8, verse 34. And there we read, And calling the crowd to himself with his disciples, Jesus said to them, if anyone would come after me, that's salvation language. I'm going to be a disciple of Christ. If anyone would come after me, what? Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Folk, that is a description of the hard path that Jesus is referring to here in Matthew chapter 7. This is a path that is marked by self denial. This is a path that is marked by submission and obedience to Jesus Christ as King and Master and Lord. This is a path that is marked by a willingness to maybe even suffer for Christ and the gospel. That certainly marks this road. Being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ and living under his kingdom is going to cost you. And that's why as we look at this text carefully this morning, that's why we see that the numbers on this path are so few. Because people in their sin don't want to give up. People in their sin don't want to relinquish. People in their sin don't want to be under the authority of Jesus Christ as king of their lives. The love for the world and the things of the world is just so strong. As John writes in 1 John 2, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life are so alluring, so captivating. We long for those things. It's hard to give those up. But we've got to as we come through the narrow gate and walk that hard road. It's much more easy or much easier and much more satisfying to trust in my own human goodness and effort. And people don't want that, folk. They want a path to heaven that doesn't cost them, that doesn't cause them to change anything. That's why the broad gate and the easy way or the broad gate and the easy path are so alluring. God says. To us in uh, Hebrews chapter 12, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And people are like, no, but I, I, I like that sin. I like those issues. I don't want to give those up. 
God says to us in Ephesians chapter 4, put off your old self which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And people are like, we don't want that. We like the way we used to live. I enjoyed that lifestyle. I enjoyed that sin. I enjoyed what I had. I don't want to give that up for the cause of Christ and the gospel. I don't want to have to change. I don't want to have to be renewed. I don't want to have to be transformed. I don't want to have to grow to be more Christ-like and more holy. And you guess why the numbers on that road are so few? But there are some, praise God, even some here this morning, hopefully many of us here this morning is, Members of our church are on that path. Praise God for that. The real, genuine believers are on that path, truly following and submitting to the Lord Jesus Christ. They've come to the narrow gate. They've submitted to Christ alone. They've come through naked and but been dressed in His royal robes. And now they're submitting to His Lordship. They're obeying Him as King. Yes, they're struggling with sin. Yes, they're struggling with temptation. Yes, they cry out with the Apostle Paul, a wretched man that I am, who will free me from this body of death? There are daily struggles on that path, that's true. But they're walking in the power of the Spirit. They're walking in the power of victory. They're putting sin to death even as they grieve over their sin and deal with their sin day by day. But they're on that hard path, wanting to give up that which is offensive to the King who who they love. These few believers on that narrow, hard way have denied themselves. They're trying to follow and obey what Jesus demands. They're walking that hard road of opposition and persecution, maybe even facing rejection from friends and family. These are the believers who are filling up even in their own bodies the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a hard way where we give up that which we love and as we face rejection from others. The Apostle Paul knew that as he did the rounds in terms of his various missionary journeys, as we read there in Acts of the Apostles, Paul moving from region to region and from church to church, what did he do? Acts chapter 14, 22, Paul was strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, to continue down the narrow path, to continue down that hard way, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Paul realized it was hard, and so he went and encouraged, and he strengthened, and he edified, and he tried to build into the lives of those believers who were struggling down that way for the cause of their Christ and the gospel. Those believers, it's not all just hard and drudgery at all. Those believers that walk that narrow path have a deep sense of joy and peace. They are running the race that is set before them, looking unto Jesus, the founder and perfecter of their faith who for the joy set before him endured the cross and is seated at the right hand of God. They're following in their master's footsteps, looking at the eternal joy and reward that is to come. These believers know that they're headed for heaven. They know that they're going to be heading for glory and reward and eternal life. Those on that path, even though it is hard, the road marked with suffering that we sang a little bit earlier, know that they're going to be hearing those words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. That is the joy that is set before them. Praise God for that. Many here this morning would be on that road and we praise God for his grace and mercy to rescue us from destruction and get us through that narrow gate onto that particular path. And so, folks, as we look at the, this text this morning, verses 13 and 14, the two gates and the two paths stand in front of us. And I think the question comes very simply from the Lord Jesus Christ directly to us. Which gate have you entered through and which path are you on? Which gate have you entered through and which path are you on? Jesus, in his love and his grace and his compassion, warns us that is true. He paints a picture of both the warning and the eternal joy that lies ahead. But even in those verses, he issues a command. It is not a plea. Jesus is not standing and begging and knocking. Jesus in these moments, friends, is not inviting. He is commanding a response from us. Even as we look at those two gates, and the two paths that lie ahead. If you're on the path 
leading from the narrow way, leading to life and heaven. Praise God for that. I pray that the Lord would strengthen you and encourage you and give you joy even as you walk that in a celebration of His grace, leading for life eternal. But in these moments, if you realize that you're on that path heading for destruction, thinking you're okay, thinking you're a Christian, thinking you're okay with God, and God by His Spirit is convicting you as to the fact that you're not, that you're deceived, that Satan has pulled the wool over your eyes, can I exhort you, get off. Get off that path. Turn back, go through the narrow gate, and enter into the path that leads to life, the path through Christ alone that leads to heaven and the presence of God forever. And therefore, folk, as we close this morning, let's go back to those early words right at the beginning of verse 13. And both hear and heed the clear commandment of Jesus. Hear and heed the command of Jesus Christ. Enter by the narrow gate. That is a command that is to obey if you are to be reconciled with God. That is a command that is to be obeyed if you are to enjoy a relationship with Him. That is a command that is to obey if you are to enter heaven one day. The Sermon on the Mount and all the rich teaching on salvation and kingdom and kingdom ethics and how we're to live is not just to be enjoyed. It is not just to be admired. It is not just to sit back on a Sunday and go, well, that was a great sermon. I felt warmed in terms of my heart. These are issues that need to be obeyed. Hear the command of Jesus. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Which gate and which path are you on? Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the fact that the living and active word of God is that double-edged sword and that there are warnings given that uh, not all of Scripture is just to give us life lessons and encouragement and make us feel warm and fuzzy and joyful. But, Lord, in your goodness, you wake us up And a text like this, Lord, is certainly that we can see the red lights flashing, we can hear the sirens, we can hear the warning bells in terms of the issues of the gates and the paths. Father, we do pray, won't you encourage believers to cause us to leave here this morning just being blown away and thankful to you for rescuing us from our own darkness and pushing us through those turnstiles onto that narrow way. And Father, we do pray, lead us to glory. Father, those whom you have justified, you will also glorify. He who began a good work and you will bring it to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. Carry us down that path to glory, we pray, and we entrust ourselves to you in that way. And Father, I do pray for any here or any listening later that might be deceived by Satan as to where they stand and to where they are with God, having gone through some broad gate onto a way that seems so easy, who are naming the name of Christ, who are thinking they're okay, who might be very diligent churchgoers, but are living lives that are just totally contrary to the gospel. Father, I pray, be gracious to convict, be gracious to rescue, be gracious to save, and glorify your Son even through that sovereign work of salvation. As sinners are plucked from the broad way and brought through the narrow gates, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.